Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Malcolm Knight on the subject of governance of the international financial system. Hello and welcome to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week, we're joined on the program by an expert in international governance, uh, international public policy, or some other aspect of international affairs. Today, my guest is Dr. Malcolm Knight. He is a distinguished fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation and a professor of finance at the London School of Economics and Politics. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Andrew. Malcolm, a few years ago, you wrote a very interesting piece in the American Review of Canadian Studies about the differences between the American banking system and the Canadian banking system and trying to explain why the Canadian system seemed to come out of the crisis uh, as well as it did. Um, could you say a little bit about the differences between the two banking systems? Well, the two banking systems are, are very different. Uh, what um, the federal government has built in Canada is essentially a system where there is a small number of universal banks, banks that do on balance sheet um, deposit taking and lending, but also do investment banking, proprietary trading, um, uh, securities dealing, wealth management, and so on. That's a universal bank. In the United States, uh, the United States does have 20 or 30 institutions that could be regarded as universal banks and are global and do all these sorts of operations. But it also has over 7,000 very small banks right. that take deposits, make loans, and have a regional presence. And of course, that um, whole process of deposit taking and, uh, and, and lending is very much focused on credit to the private sector and particularly on mortgage lending. Um, I think the big difference between banks in Canada, though, and banks in the United States is that banks in Canada are the result of the regular revisions of the Canadian Bank Act, in which the authorities had a conscious policy of gradually building banks that took over the operations of previously separate sectors like mortgage loan companies and trust companies right. and indeed the credit unions. In the United States there was deregulation but re deregulation which took place from about the middle 1980s was more uh, uh, in the form of uh, a set of processes that pleased one interest group or another at various times and didn't really have a clear uh, vision. So in the financial crisis, what happened was that we had a Canadian banking system where the banks essentially took deposits from the non-bank private sector and lent them out, admittedly heavily in the mortgage markets, but in mortgage markets where they held the mortgages on their balance sheets right. and were therefore very concerned about the quality of their underwriting and the servicing of their loans. In the United States, particularly with the pressure from the authorities to, uh, to uh, build home ownership in the United States uh, and the, the uh, operation of the uh, government um, agencies like Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie right. Mac, there was a very uh, strong impetus to securitize mortgages that started in the 1980s. And that process rolled on and on, and what I think people didn't appreciate in the early 2000s was the degree to which the securitization of mortgages, and particularly the uh, construction of exotic structured uh, credit products, had been associated with a really serious deterioration in mortgage underwriting standards. Right. That didn't happen in Canada because the banks kept the mortgages on their balance sheets. Right. And I think that's a fundamental difference between the two systems that made the Canadian banks much more robust to the crisis. And just picking up on that point, you do, uh, towards the end of the paper, you do warn that a lot of the structural problems within the U.S. system are present in the Canadian banking system. This idea that the big five in Canada are too big to fail, 
um, the the growing uh, low interest rates and the growing um, system where Canadians can in, who might not take on a lot of debt are being encouraged to take on more debt. Um, is the the Canadian banking system as stable as we might like to think? The Canadian banking system was very robust to the crisis we had, uh, which started in 2007 and in a sense has en endured ever since. Um, but uh, obviously a system in which we have five uh, banks at the national level and a six which has an important uh, regional presence is one where there is a lot of market concentration. And it is probably true that if one of those banks got into serious trouble, it would be difficult either to um, close it down or to uh, merge it with another institution without having a negative impact on competition in the Canadian economy. So that is a big challenge. That said, the universal banking model which Canada has built is a model which has worked very well in Canada. It's worked well in Australia. It's worked well in New Zealand. And it is a, a model which is fairly suitable to smaller economies, economies that don't have a large corporate bond or commercial paper market right. like the United States. So there are advantages and disadvantages to the system. I think it is broadly more robust than the U.S. system, but there is the potential for a too big to fail problem, no doubt about it. Great. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment with Malcolm Knight. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back to the program. Malcolm, I wonder if we might uh, focus on the global setting. And um, what, is difference now, what is different now with respect to the governance of the international financial system versus the situation or the context we had pre-crisis? I would say that the financial crisis fundamentally changed the architecture of financial regulation and the governance of financial regulation. Um, before, um, before the crisis, um, the international aspects of financial regulation were essentially managed through the Basel Committee on Banking right. Supervision, which had a membership of the 11 countries of the G10. And coordination in macroeconomic policy was managed by really the G7 summit and finance ministers process um, and operated through the multilateral surveillance of the International Monetary Fund. That system really failed to anticipate uh, that we would have a crisis and uh, failed, uh, I think, to, to really anticipate the kinds of policy actions that would be needed. So in the depths of the crisis, in uh, late 2008, a new development occurred. The G20, which is a combination of advanced industrial countries and the large emerging market countries, had been meeting, it was actually established by uh, Paul Martin right. when he was finance minister of Canada, it had been meeting at the finance ministers and central bank governors uh, level for a number of years but it never met at the summit leaders level. And in November of uh, 2008, in the depths of the financial crisis, the uh, heads of state and government of the G20 countries met together. And they did two things. First of all, they produced a very, very detailed um, uh, program and timetable for reforming the architecture of financial regulation. And they also set out and established a, 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 an impetus uh, to coordinate their macroeconomic policies by engaging in fiscal stimulus to offset the negative effects of the crisis on output and employment. Right. That then spawned the Financial Stability Board, uh, which uh, was designed by the G20 to really coordinate 
the uh, implementation of financial regulatory reform. And it's led to important um, uh, initiatives for changes in governments, the governance of the International Monetary Fund to strengthen the voice of the emerging market and developing countries right. in uh, the fund and to strengthen its multilateral surveillance which fosters economic co policy coordination. So the changes have been very, very substantial. And to what extent do these reforms rely on essentially moral persuasion or naming and shaming um, in order to be effective? You know, I think that's a really good question because um, one of the challenges here is that um, economic policy cooperation really doesn't take place in normal times when finance ministers and leaders think they can make a small gain by altering right. their, 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 their policies. It really uh, is fostered when they're staring into the abyss, when there's really a huge downside risk if cooperation doesn't take place. Now that's a good thing because it, I think that what the G20 did, particularly in the initial phases of the crisis, was really fairly effective. Right. Um, the problem is that that kind of cooperation kinds to, tends to dissipate sure. as time goes on and the crisis has passed. So it really is important that the cooperation in economic policy takes place in the context of a treaty-based organization where countries have clear responsibilities uh, as well as rights. Right. And uh, the obvious institution to do that is the International Monetary Fund. But at the same time, the fund has been criticized in recent years for being too much influenced by the large advanced countries. And so the fund has endeavored to undertake reforms to try to give uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, all of the member countries, 188 member countries, right. more voice in its decisions. This is an ongoing process and I hope it will succeed because that's the way coordination of economic right. policies has to take place in the long run. One of the criticisms I've heard of the IMF, um, pre-crisis and even post-crisis, is that the, those who were working at the fund, who were enga engaged in surveillance, were sometimes afraid to speak truth to power, or when they did, often their advice was ignored. Is this still a problem within the IMF? Well, we can always see these problems in retrospect. Right. I think the basic point is that uh, you can always see a lot of um, downside risks, and the question is, you know, how likely they are to occur. And it's very difficult to give advice when you could uh, uh, say the sky is falling in and have it not do so. Right. I think the fund has generally been fairly good in this area, but there have been weaknesses for right. certain. Right. Well, thank you very much. We will be back in a moment with Malcolm Knight. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. All right. Welcome back. Malcolm, I wonder if we could pick up on our last discussion uh, about the IMF and uh, broadly institutional reform of the international financial system. What is happening right now and what still needs to be done? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the IMF uh, several years ago uh, instituted an initiative to have a quota review which would give it increased resources for its lending activities, but also would alter the structure of its board of directors in order to give um, the emerging market and developing countries more voice. Right. That quota review has to be approved by the, uh, a high vote of the uh, member countries. Right. The member uh, voting is weighted according to the economic size of countries, so large countries are import important in that. And um, that improvement in governance, which I think everybody really wants, 
uh, has not been completed. The U.S. Congress has just decided not to take a vote to uh, to uh, go ahead with that. I assume that that may be a temporary postponement and everyone is calling for the U.S. to go ahead and approve that so that it can come into force. I think that's an important element. As I, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, you know, we've moved from a, a relatively narrow group of the G7 uh, managing uh, affairs in international economics and fostering economic policy coordination to the G20, but that's a still a self-selected group. Right. And we need to broaden that. We need to have an institution that can speak truth to power. We need to have an institution right. that can be an independent assessor of the quality of countries' economic policies and also their financial regulatory policies. And I think that this role should be performed by the fund. There are, uh, there are ways that the fund could improve its work in this way. It's done a lot to um, strengthen what it's called its surveillance process, its consultations with individual countries, right. and the way it puts them together into a view of what is a good set of policies for the key systemically important countries. Um, and that is, I think, a very useful thing. It's called multilateral right. surveillance in the fund's parlance. I think that's a very useful thing. I think the fund also plays a very important and useful role uh, in assuring uh, the, uh, the, the spread of best practices right. in financial markets and in financial regulations through a program it has called the Financial System, system Assessment Program. And uh, that is something which is being integrated now with uh, bilateral and multilateral surveillance and I think will, uh, will be very important. And the reason that's important is because harmonization of key regulatory rules like capital adequacy and liquidity of large core financial institutions Harmonizing those rules internationally is very important because if they're not harmonized internationally, we'll get one of the problems we had last time, right. which is a tendency for risky activities to migrate to those areas and jurisdictions where they're least well regulated, and that can cause financial problems. So given what you've just outlined and the stakes involved, why is the U.S. Congress being so difficult? Do they, do they see IMF reform as essentially a zero-sum game where uh, opening it up, making it more inclusive, is essentially seen as uh, a diminution or loss of American influence? Well, I think this really is a question of internal U.S. politics at the present time. I don't think... Um, it's likely to be a, uh, a, a permanent obstruction to strengthening the governance of international financial institutions. But I think there is an issue here because, as I said, in um, the, the ad hoc co coordination among countries, the impetus tends to weaken as soon as the crisis is right. passed. And we don't want to have a long period when there's no established agreed system of governance of the process of coordinating or at least cooperating in economic and financial uh, policies. So it is urgent, I think, to make a decision about what sort of body and what set of rules should be used by all countries in a neutral way in order to come to these decisions and implement these policies. I think if we didn't have the International Monetary Fund, right. we'd have to invent it. Sure. Uh, as uh, an ongoing body for, for cooperation in economic policies. And that's why I think it's so important to go forward with the reforms that the fund management has been, has been, uh, ha has been moving along on. Great. Well, thank you very much. We will be back in a moment with Malcolm Knight. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter.
Welcome back. Malcolm, to conclude the episode, um, I'd like to get your thoughts on where you think the system is going. How is, where do you think the, the international financial system will evolve going forward over the next few years or even decades? Well, the G20 um, reform program for the architecture of regulation got off to, I think, quite a good start. It increased the capital adequacy, particularly the core banks in the system. It's uh, created the idea of counter-cyclical capital buffers so that um, institutions build up capital at times when things are buoyant uh, so that they can use it when, 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 uh, when the Minsky moment occurs and there are, uh, there's a withdrawal, general withdrawal from risk. So that's been a good thing. I think the worry I have is that that spirit of cooperation, particularly um, between the regulatory community and the financial system, the, the private financial system, but also uh, among the regulatory regulators in the different jurisdictions. That um, uh, cooperation, cooperative spirit is fragmenting a bit. Right. When that happens, it tends to uh, create incentives for regulators to uh, adjust regulation in their own jurisdictions to favor national champions or to gain a, or at least uh, avoid a competitive disadvantage relative to other jurisdictions. That's a kind of race to the bottom and that is what we have right. to avoid. And that's why I think that the, the IMF's uh, financial system assessment program is, is quite helpful in avoiding that kind of uh, regulatory um, uh, 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 fragmentation. Right. So that's an important element. If that doesn't happen, I think we will have a stronger and more robust financial system. That said, there's been a lot of talk about macroprudential right. regulation of the financial system, oversight bodies that should see the risks emerging and do something proactively about them. Unfortunately, although those agencies have been set up, Macroprudential regulation is still essentially an empty shell. The, the processes aren't there to do right. it. And perhaps to, to wrap up on that point, since 2008, the markets have, of course, rebounded. But expectations about the future and the future of the global economy, I think, are still quite pessimistic. Uh, governments in the West are concerned with austerity and deficit reduction. Uh, social safety nets are being eroded. Individual debt is at record highs. Young people are graduating into a tough economy. Um, do you envision, you know, essentially this being the new normal, um, at least for the foreseeable future, assuming that that assessment is correct? Well, I think we, uh, if we look at the longer term for the global economy, there are huge challenges here. I think they can be managed so that the global economy can uh, start growing again at a rate that's not hugely lower, although it will probably be somewhat lower than it has been in the past. Because on what's happened over the past 20 years is that a huge segment of labor in India, in China, in the large countries of Latin America, and to some degree also in the Middle East and North Africa, has come into the labor market. That's right. affected wages and skills in the advanced countries as well. And so that has been a real challenge. As we go forward, these countries have become quite dynamic. They, ha they use the latest technology. Uh, they, most of them still have relatively high rates of population increase, which is the opposite of a number of other uh, countries, including the advanced countries in China. And so we're going to see very big changes in uh, the relative economic size of countries. The challenge right now and over the next five to ten, maybe even uh, ten years, maybe even longer, is in the labor market in all countries. In the advanced countries, there seems to be a mismatch 
between skills and the kinds of activities that uh, pay in the uh, emerging market and developing countries. The educational system is, is not generalized enough to give um, individuals equal opportunities across countries right. and regions. These are the challenges that need to be addressed. And I think in a lot of countries, education policy, particularly public education policy, is not sufficiently attuned to what's going to be needed going forward. But that said, I think if we can manage the macroeconomic policies to gradually get out of the hole that was dug by the uh, international financial crisis and the uh, global recession, we should get on to a, a more stable growth path going forward, and that hopefully will gradually build uh, opportunities for employment. But it's not an easy time, right. that's for sure. And are you confident that we'll eventually get there? Or do you feel that there may be some more regression before we, before we see the light? Well, I think um, there's, uh, it's not a question of confidence. We have to make our own future. Oh, right. We have to have, I think, better cooperation in macroeconomic policy among countries. We have to have better and better harmonized uh, regulation of financial institutions and markets across countries. These steps are being taken. It's very important that the fragmentation that I spoke about earlier is not allowed to continue. Right. And I think it's important that the, the uh, cooperation is undertaken in the context of the international financial institutions so that it's done on a rules-based basis. The voting reflects the views of the membership at large and not just a subset of countries. And there are uniform obligations on all members. So Malcolm, just to, to wrap up, is there one specific reform that could be made in the immediate term that would help stabilize the global economy or help us go down the, the path that you've outlined? Andrew, it's not a matter of isolating one policy, just like it's not a matter of isolating one country as the engine of growth. Right. Uh, we, have to, um, we have to proceed in a, in, a, in a systematic way on a number of fronts. In financial regulatory reform, I think there are two elements that are really important. One is harmonization of the rules across right. jurisdictions, not across different sectors. Different sectors should be subject to, uh, with different business models, should be subject to different regulatory rules. Right. But across countries and jurisdictions, they should be the same. That's really important. Let's try to stick to that. In macroeconomic policy, it's a much more difficult question because macroeconomic policy is not a sort of a structural policy like regulation. It's conjunctural. It depends on economic circumstances. And now it, I think there are several things that need to be done. One is that those countries that can uh, need to continue to operate somewhat accommodative fiscal policies. Right. But those, and that is partly because those countries that have high debt levels are going to have to engage in austerity. So we need to maintain the growth of demand in the global system. Right. But at the same time, we do need to gradually normalize uh, monetary policy, particularly in the three or four key jurisdictions. Right. We don't need to name them. Everybody knows which ones they are. And steady as she goes in um, normalizing monetary policy uh, will, I think, also be crucial. So consistency of regulatory reform, some continued accommodation in fiscal policies in those countries that have the capacity to do that, and a gradual normalization of monetary policy uh, I think will um, sort of optimize 
the opportunities relative to the risks yeah. going forward. Great. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, and thank you to our audience for tuning in. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. The federal government has built in Canada is essentially a system where there is a small number of universal banks, banks that do on balance sheet um, deposit taking and lending, but also do investment banking, proprietary trading, um, uh, securities dealing, wealth management, and so on. That's a universal bank. In the United States, uh, the United States does have 20 or 30 institutions that could be regarded as universal banks and are global and do all these sorts of operations. But it also has over 7,000 very small banks right. that take deposits, make loans, and have a re Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Malcolm Knight on the subject of governance of the international financial system. Hello and welcome to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week, we're joined on the program by an expert in international governance. Regional presence. And of course, that um, whole process of deposit taking and, uh, and, and lending is very much focused on credit to the private sector and particularly on mortgage lending. Um, I think the big difference between banks in Canada, though, and banks in the United States is that banks in Canada are the result of the regular revisions of the Canadian Bank Act in which the authorities had a conscious policy of gradually building banks that took over the operations of previously separate sectors like mortgage loan companies and trust companies right. and indeed the credit unions. In the United States, uh, international public policy or some other aspect of international affairs. Today my guest is Dr. Malcolm Knight. He is a distinguished fellow here at the Center for International Governance and Innovation and a professor of finance at the London School of Economics and Politics. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Andrew. Malcolm, a few years ago you wrote a very interesting piece in the American Review of Canadian Studies about the differences between the American banking system and the Canadian banking system and trying to explain why the Canadian system seemed to come out of the crisis uh, as well as it did. Um, could you say a little bit about the differences between the two banking systems? Well, the two banking systems are, are very different. Uh, what um, There was deregulation, but re deregulation, which took place from about the middle 1980s, was more uh, uh, in the form of uh, uh, a set of processes that pleased one interest group or another at various times and didn't really have a clear uh, vision. So in the financial crisis, what happened was that we had a Canadian banking system where the banks essentially took deposits from the non-bank private sector and lent them out, admittedly heavily in the mortgage markets, but in mortgage markets where they held the mortgages on their balance sheets. Right and were therefore very concerned about the quality of their underwriting and the servicing of their loans.